Hi, my name is Travis Pollan, and this presentation is on exercise prescription and program design. I'm a PhD student in rehab sciences at Drexel University, and I also have my diploma in personal training from the National Personal Training Institute. Since 2013, I have experienced training everyone from general population clients all the way up to pro athletes, and I've done a lot of writing training programs. So my goal with this presentation is to share some of what I've learned about programming along the way. The objectives for today's presentation are to describe the elements of a thorough needs analysis, categorize exercises based on movement patterns, design an individualized strength training program based on the needs analysis with a logical sequencing of exercises and pairings of exercises, and appropriate workout parameters like sets, reps, tempo, and rating of perceived exertion. Finally, I want to help you gain some awareness of advanced techniques in exercise prescription and program design. Today, I'll be focusing on strength training, but obviously there are lots of other modes of exercise, like endurance training and speed training, and underlying all of these things would be flexibility and coordination, so I want you to know that a comprehensive program would include a warm-up, speed training, conditioning, flexibility training, all of those things in addition to strength, but that is going to be beyond the scope of this talk. So why focus on strength training? Well, first I wanted to keep the presentation to around an hour, and second because if you had to pick one of the modes of training for long-term health and well-being, I think it would be strength. And for, lastly, we have the best evidence uh, in the scientific literature for strength training. So the first thing that we're going to do when we're designing a training program is this thing called a needs analysis. And this is just a fancy word for a goal meeting. So we sit down with the trainee and we do document their age and their sex, of course, and then their training history. So how long have they been training, if at all? Uh, if they've been training anything less than two months, the NSCA Essentials of Strength and Conditioning textbook classifies these people as beginners. Two, months the, two to six months would be intermediate, and then anything over a year is advanced. And then you see the frequency here, one to two days a week for beginners, and a little bit more frequent for intermediate and advanced. So the cool thing when, uh, in my experience, is that most of the people that I've trained, apart from, you know, the pro athletes, were beginners. And so uh, the nice thing about beginners is that just about everything works for them. So we can be confident that people will benefit from the programs that we write for them, even if they're not perfect. And in reality, there really is no such thing as a perfect training program. The next thing that we need to consider when we are writing workouts is the person's injury history and their medical history. Um, we will work around injuries uh, as best we can, and if, the, um, if they have pain that persists for a long period of time, we'll refer them out to medical professionals. Uh, and then the next thing we need to know is what is their training status. So when was the last time the person exercised? Uh, if they have been exercising uh, very recently, then that's going to mean one thing. If it's been a year since they last exercised, or maybe they've never exercised, then that's going to mean something quite different from an exercise prescription and program design standpoint. And probably the most important thing is what is what are the person's goals? So what do they want to be able to do relative to what they are currently able to do? Are there certain activities that they want to be participating in, certain movements that they want to be able to do? And what do they need from a training program in order to get them to their goals? So maybe it's more strength or power or muscle hypertrophy, muscle growth, muscular endurance, fat loss, and oftentimes it's a combination of all, all or many of these things. We want to make a note of the person's strengths and their weaknesses so that we can cater to their strengths and also address their weaknesses at the same time. Similarly, we want to know about their likes and dislikes because we know that adherence to an exercise program increases as enjoyment goes up. So the more the person likes to do whatever we're asking them to do, the more likely they are actually to do it. And availability. So how much time can they commit to training? Uh, if they only have two days a week, but the 
based on the fact that they're advanced, they, they should be training four days. Well, we're going to write them a two day a week training program because that's all the time that they commit. So how many, how many, how many days a week can they do and how much time can they commit per session? Lastly, we need to know about access to equipment. So do they have access to a fully stocked gym with barbells and kettlebells and sandbags and anything that you can think of? Or are they training at home with a few token dumbbells and maybe body weight, or maybe they only have body weight? So of course that's going to impact the exercises that we can prescribe. So after the goal meeting, it's time to start thinking about selecting exercises. And so typically when people talk about their training, they talk about which muscles that they're working on in a given session. So everybody knows that Monday is International Chest Day, and then Tuesday or Wednesday is Back Day, and then you have Leg Day somewhere in there, uh, abs, shoulders. So it's not wrong to think about training muscles, but I believe that when we concentrate on training muscles, we tend to overemphasize the fronts of our body, so the mirror muscles that we can see when we look in the mirror, and our upper body relative to our lower body gets more work. So a paradigm shift for me was when I first learned about training movement patterns instead of training muscles. And so the quote goes from Vern Gambetta that if you train movements, you never will miss muscles, but the converse isn't necessarily true. If you're focusing on muscles, then you may neglect your movement patterns. So let's break down these movement patterns one at a time. The first one is the upper body push. So this is anything where you are pushing weight away from your body or in a body weight exercise where your hands are fixed, you might be pushing your body away from the fixed attachment point. These exercises will target the chest, the triceps, and the delts. Next we have upper body pulling exercises. So these are exercises that you are pulling your body towards the fixed attachment point, or you might be pulling weight towards your body. Uh, these exercises primarily hit the back, biceps, the rhomboids, and the mid traps. For the lower body, we have squatting and lunging movement patterns. So sometimes you'll see these as two separate categories but I like to lump them together as just more broadly knee dominant exercises. So these exercises are characterized by deep knee flexion with about an equal amount of hip flexion. So if you look at these, the person's at about 90 degrees of knee flexion at the bottom, maybe a little bit more, and their hips are also at about 90 degrees of knee flexion. These exercises primarily hit the quads, uh, but they'll also of course hit the hamstrings and glutes a little bit too. Next we have hip dominant exercises or hip hinges. And so these exercises also have deep knee flexion, but unlike the knee dominant exercises, they have a little bit less knee flexion. So as a result of the uh, increase in hip flexion relative to knee flexion, these exercises primarily hit the posterior chain muscles, which are the hamstrings, the glutes, and the spinal erectors. Our next exercise category is locomotion. So this is anything where the person is moving from one place to another. They could be pushing a sled or they could be carrying weight or they might be crawling in an animal-like fashion. Our second to last category is rotation. And so this is any movement that's occurring in the transverse plane. It's particularly important for athletes because they rotate, many of them rotate a lot in their sport, but also people rotate in their everyday activities as well. And it's something that we often neglect when we are just uh, concentrating on exercises like squats and deadlifts and bench press. Last category is resisting movement. Uh, you might also hear this called anti-movement. So these are anti-rotation, anti-lateral flexion, and anti-extension exercises. So the bird dog is the anti-rotation exercise, the side plank of course is the anti-lateral flexion exercise, and the dead bug is the anti-extension exercise where we're talking about having to keep the person's low back on the floor, uh, engaging their abs to prevent from extending at their lumbar spine. 
And one final throwaway category is what I'm just calling everything else. So these are things that don't fall into the seven categories that I showed before. So these would be exercises that are training your grip or rotator cuff, maybe the lower leg or the lateral hip. Any isolated muscle training would uh, be lumped into this everything else category. So when you're thinking about selecting exercises from those categories, we first have to choose how many exercises we're going to have in the session, and then we'll choose which movement patterns we'll use, and then finally, which variations of those movement patterns and which implements or types of external load we'll be using. So let's break down each of these steps one at a time. The first step will be to choose the number of exercises in the session, and this really boils down to how much time the person has to train. So for a shorter session, 10, 15, 20 minutes, we'll probably choose fewer exercises, maybe two or three in a short session. And if the person has an hour, then we might give them as many as 12 or even more exercises. Those exercises, whether it's two or three or 12, will be broken down into primary exercises, which you might also hear called core exercises, but I find that term confusing uh, in light of the fact that it's the same word as torso training. Uh, so the primary exercises are your multi-joint exercises that are hitting large muscles and they have a relatively high loading capacity. So that means that you can use a lot of external load for them. So when we're designing workouts, we want to choose a few of these primary exercises. And then if there's time, we will also choose a few accessory or assistance exercises. So these would be your single joint exercises that hit smaller muscles, they have a little bit lower loading capacity uh, and they're nice to have but not necessarily need to have exercises. So again, uh, time permitting, we'll choose, a few, we'll choose a few of these per workout. The next step is to choose the movement patterns. So the principle of specificity dictates that people adapt to the demands that are imposed on them. So we want to choose movements that are specific to their goals, that are specific to their target activities, and that also address their deficiencies. The truth is that just about everyone does the same seven basic movement patterns in their activities of daily living and sport. So everybody is squatting to get up and down off of chairs, to get into and out of their car. Everyone is hip hinging to pick things up off the floor, pushing and pulling. So the differences in exercise prescription from person to person, whether it's a male or a female, a young person or an older person, someone who's athletic or sedentary, the differences are really in degree and not kind. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel for every different person that we have with different target activities. The specificity comes from the specific variations of the movement patterns that we select, as well as the parameters of those movement patterns like the sets and reps. And then also the accessory exercises will be more targeted for that person and their specific needs. But in general, the primary movements, everybody's going to have those seven. Uh, and then the specific implementation will be based on their uh, specific needs. So one quote unquote hack for a full body workout would be to simply choose one exercise from each of your seven categories. And that's the workout. Which movement patterns you choose for the workout will be dictated by the training split. So like I said before, for a full body workout, you could just choose one exercise from each category, but also a common way of splitting up training is a body part split. So this would be where you train one or two muscle groups per session. Uh, so you might do your chest and tries on one day, back and biceps on another day and so on. So this split is especially good for physique oriented exercisers who want to devote equal attention to each of their muscle groups. It allows for increased volume per muscle group per session. So you're doing a lot of sets of chest on chest day and a lot of sets of back on back day. It tends to make people more sore. So for people who like that, that's great. And it also requires more gym time in general. So if you're using a body part split, you might be in there five, six, seven days a week even. And that can be nice for people who want to be in the gym a lot. Uh, on the other side of the coin, you have full body training. So this would be better for people who are more strength or performance oriented um, because it doesn't isolate the body uh, into muscles. It looks more at movements. 
Uh, so this is a little bit better for providing equal attention to the posterior side of the body and the lower body. It allows the person to train each muscle group more frequently. So instead of just doing chest seven days apart on Mondays, there might be a chest exercise on Monday and another one on Wednesday and another one on Saturday. And uh, it, with this, uh, based on this, the person might be less sore because they're not doing as much volume within a given session. And so for somebody who doesn't want to get as sore, that might be more desirable. It's a little bit more practical in case of a missed session. So with the split training program, if chest is on Mondays, but the person misses a scheduled workout, then that means that they will have to shift their training a little bit to make up for that workout. So instead of doing, uh, let's say they missed leg day on Saturday, now they have to shift leg day to Monday. Suddenly they're going from training chest on Monday to not training it again until nine days later on Wednesday or whatever the case is. So when you train a full body split, you don't have to worry about that so much because you are hitting the entire body every session. And uh, in general, I think that people are less likely to skip leg day on full body training because there are leg exercises in every workout. So I prefer full body training because newsflash, most people are not bodybuilders and split training comes from bodybuilding. So I prefer full body training, but I will say that as the person gets more advanced, they might choose to employ a training split. And so if a person is going to use a training split, my preferred splits are either upper body and then lower body or pushing versus pulling. So if you think about pushing, I'm talking about both upper body pushes and knee dominant exercises, and then pulling would be upper body pulling exercises and hip dominant exercises. So you can see uh, here are examples of what you would the person would do, whether they were doing a two day or three day or four day split. But the question then is, well, how do we know how many days per week to recommend? And so that's basically the frequency, how many sessions per week, and that's going to depend on the person's training age. So the NSCA recommends that beginners train two or three days a week, intermediate trainees three to four, and advanced four to seven. And the primary reason for this is recovery. So beginners might have a little bit harder of a time recovering between workouts, which means that they're going to need a day or two in between each session. But it also, of course, frequency will depend on the person's availability. So if they are advanced and the recommendation is that they should train four days a week, but they can only devote two days a week for 30 minutes to training, then that's going to take precedent. The fewer sessions that the person has to devote per week means that we'll have to stick more to the basics. So just those seven categories, the primary exercises. If the person has more sessions per week, that means that we can devote more time to getting into the weeds a little bit with the accessory exercises, uh, which kind of fill the gaps uh, that the primary exercises don't provide. But if the person only has time for the primary exercises, then so be it. The third step in this process of exercise selection is choosing the variation of the exercise. So let's say that we have a squat on the docket. How do we decide whether the person is going to do a back squat or a goblet squat or a bodyweight squat? So what their training status is, uh, whether they're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced is really going to be the primary driver of this. So if the person is a beginner, they're going to go more towards the left side of this continuum. If they haven't trained in a while, they'll go more towards the left. And uh, just basically, what is their ability? So if you test somebody out and they look great in a bodyweight squat, then you can give them some external load. If they don't look so good in a bodyweight squat, then you might want to give them um, something like the TRX assisted squat or a squat to a box where they're offloading their body weight a little bit or they have, in the case of a box, something to aim for and to help them gauge depth. So start on the left, and as the person becomes more advanced, you can go into these more um, heavy-duty exercises with a barbell where you have more loading capacity. So you can do the same thing in the case of a hip hinge, where you would start with something more grooving of the hip hinge pattern, followed by a kettlebell deadlift maybe, and then a hex bar deadlift, and then a barbell deadlift. So as the person gets more advanced, as they have more experience, as they uh, become better equipped to handle higher loads, we go towards the right. 
So this basic process of uh, looking at the movement and thinking about the continuum from uh, unloaded exercise to heavily loaded exercise is what you would do for all of the movement patterns. Uh, and so I've just shown two examples here with the squat and the deadlift. In summary, exercise selection boils down to these three steps. Choosing the number of exercises, anywhere from 2 to 12, depending on session length, and having the appropriate mix of primary and accessory exercises. From there, we choose the movement patterns based on specificity. For a full body workout, you could just choose one out of each of the seven categories. And then for immediate, intermediate or advanced trainees, I would recommend, or if they want to, instead of training full body, I would recommend the upper and lower split or the pushing and pulling split. And then finally, the last step is to choose the variations and the loading implements based on the person's ability, their status, their training history. So now that we have selected the movement patterns and the exercises, we need to figure out how we're going to sequence the exercises over the course of the workout. So this little diagram shows that after a person's warm up, their preparedness is at its peak. And as the workout goes, it tends to decrease sort of independent of what the person's doing. So as long as they're working, their preparedness is going down. So given that fact, we want to be placing the primary exercises earlier in the workout, like immediately after warm-up, when the person is most prepared, and then put the less important things towards later in the workout, like the accessory and the conditioning exercises. So here are a few more specific examples of how we would go about ordering exercises. So the first is that we would do our primary exercises like a squat before our accessory exercises like our rotator cuff exercises. We would similarly do our multi-joint exercises like pull-ups before our single joint exercises like bicep curls. Train the bigger muscles before the smaller muscles, so deadlifts before grip training. Power exercises before strength exercises. And the reason for this is that power exercises, because of the higher velocity, they tend to be a little bit more risky, and so we want to be more fresh. Uh, whereas if you flip that and you did your strength exercises and then did your power exercises, there might be a little bit of increased risk there. We also similarly would want to train strength before endurance. So if you trained endurance first, then you would be fatigued going into your strength exercises, and then you wouldn't get as much out of your strength exercises. And the last rule is to train your skilled movement before your unskilled movement. So here, the uh, single leg Romanian deadlift involves a balance component, and so we would want to do that before a calf raise, which is an unskilled movement. The reason that I have rules in quotation marks is because there are lots of exceptions to these rules. So you just have to know the rules, and then once you know them, you, as long as you have a good rationale, you can break them. And so in the next few slides, I'll give an example of where I might break one of these rules. Once we've chosen the sort of flow of exercises um, based on that, those rules that I showed, we have to think about how we're going to pair the exercises. So the, to contrast with pairing exercise, the typical way that we would do exercises is straight sets. And so what I mean by straight sets is, let's say the first exercise is deadlifts, the person would do all of their deadlifts first, resting in between sets, and then let's say the next exercise is push-ups, they would do all of their push-ups, and so on, and just go from one exercise to the next, finishing each one and then starting the next. We can contrast that with pairing exercises where we would alternate between two exercises back and forth so that one exercise would serve as rest from the other exercise instead of just sitting around in between sets. So what this does is it saves time because we can be alternating between exercises and we're not just resting idly. And it also can spread out fatigue if we're going to alternate between, let's say, an upper body exercise and a lower body exercise or a push and a pull. Uh, but conversely, if we wanted to do two pushes in a row, then that could promote fatigue. So it just depends on what we're aiming for. So a few examples, uh, so pairing exercises saves time. And a few examples of pairings I'm going to show here. So alternating sets, this would be like an upper body exercise and a lower body exercise. So in this example, the person would do their deadlift, then they would do a push-up, then they would rest. 
So they would go pretty quickly from the deadlift to the push-up, and that would the push-up would be the rest from the deadlift and vice versa, so then they would need less rest before going back to the deadlift again. Uh, so we have supersets too. So a superset is a pushing and a pulling movement. Sometimes you'll hear a superset as the umbrella term for all of these exercise pairings, but in the strict sense of the word, it's really just a push and a pull, or you might group a knee dominant exercise with the hip dominant exercise. And you could even do single joint exercises here, like a bicep curl with a tricep extension. Another example of an exercise pairing is a compound set. So this is when you group two similar movements together, like a reverse lunge and a goblet squat. Uh, whereas the previous two examples, the alternating sets and the supersets tend to spread out fatigue, uh, by working non-competing muscles like an agonist to antagonist or an upper and lower. This one, the compound set will actually create more fatigue because the movements are so similar. So it's, these, the compound sets are probably best reserved for intermediate to advanced trainees. Another similar example of a compound set would be a pre-exhaust or a post-exhaust set. And this would just be when you use a single joint and a multi-joint exercise uh, paired up. Next example is a contrast set. So again, this is similar movements, but now we have a strength exercise and then a power exercise. So if you remember what I said before about ordering exercises, I recommended doing power before strength, but here we're doing strength before power. And the reason for that is that we're taking advantage of a phenomenon called post-activation potentiation, where by doing the strength exercise first, we're priming the nervous system to enhance performance on the power exercise. So you just have to be careful when you're choosing the power exercise to choose one that's a little bit lower risk. So you wouldn't want to fatigue yourself in a strength exercise and then go into a box jump immediately where you might mix the box and miss the box and ding, ding your shit. The next example is an active recovery superset, or <laughs> there I said superset, but I meant to say pairing. Uh, so an active recovery set where we are lumping a primary exercise with an accessory exercise. So here the lateral band walk would be combined with an exercise like a pull-up. So your, the person's performance on the pull-up isn't going to be diminished much by the lateral band walk. It's just kind of serving as a filler or active rest in between your sets of the primary exercise. Finally, we could do a combination of the above. So in this case, I'm showing a alternating set because the person is going from a lower body exercise to two upper body exercises, but then within the upper body set exercises, they're supersetting them with a push and a pull. So you could combine three exercises, four or five, into what's called a giant set, colloquially known as a circuit. And uh, this is just a, a nice way to, like, like I said before, save time and potentially keep the person's heart rate up over the course of the workout, which would be good for fat loss. The one thing that you have to consider when you are grouping exercises together is that in addition to the exercise, whatever the exercise is targeting primarily, there might be something secondarily. And if that secondary factor is the same across all of the exercises, then that might be potentially a, a problem for some people, or it might be good for others. So let's look at these three exercises. So although the deadlift targets the lower body, the pull-up targets the upper body, and the farmer's carry targets the grip, both the deadlift and the pull-up also target the grip. So for somebody with a weak grip, their grip might be the first thing to go. And when that happens, they're not able to maximally stimulate their lower body and their upper body in the deadlift and the pull-up. They're just getting to their wit's end on grip. Alternatively, if you have somebody with a really strong grip, then they this might actually be a nice pairing of exercises because it is going to stimulate their grip while also hitting other things. So it just depends on the person and what their strengths and weaknesses are. Another example of this would be a crawl with a push-up and a dead bug. So all of these exercises are targeting the core, and for somebody with a weaker core, if you fatigue their core, and then they get into their second or third sets of push-ups and suddenly they're doing seal push-ups where their upper body is coming up before their lower body. Well, now you're not maximally stimulating the push-up, but the form is no longer uh, optimal. And so we might want to avoid a pairing like this for someone like that, 
But if you have somebody with a really strong core, then combining these three exercises would hit their core while simultaneously targeting these other movement patterns too. Okay, so now that we have chosen our movement patterns, we've chosen the specific exercises, we've ordered them and sequenced them, put them together in nice pairings, we have to think about what the parameters of those exercises are going to be are going to be, so how many sets, how many reps, what load, how hard is it going to be for them. Um, so these are what I'm calling the workout parameters. Note that when you combine some of these work workout patterns, you can get what I call combo patterns. So if you multiply the sets by the reps, that's the volume. So three sets of 10 reps would be 30 reps of volume. If you multiply the volume by the load, then you have load volume. So if you did 30 reps at 100 pounds each, that's 3,000 pounds of load volume. And then finally, if you wanted to calculate density, you would divide the load volume or just the volume by total volume, or sorry, by total time, and then that would give you the density. So 30 reps in 10 minutes would be three reps per minute, or like if you wanted to use load volume, 3,000 pounds in 10 minutes would be 300 pounds per minute. So let's look at reps first. The reps are uh, dictated by the load, of course. So the maximum number of reps that a person can do is going to be based on how much weight that they are using. If the weight makes it such that they can only do one to six reps, we generally classify this as strength. If the velocity is also high, then that would be power. Uh, for moderate reps, we're looking at more of the 6 to 12 repetition range, and so that would be uh, the adaptation that you would get from 6 to 12 reps would be muscle growth or hypertrophy. And then as you go into the higher reps, the 20s, the 12s to 20s, or maybe even more like ultra high reps, around 30 reps, 40 reps, that's all muscular endurance. Typically, beginners do best to stick to the moderate rep range, so that 6 or 8 to 12. Um, and really, you can do any exercise for any number of reps, but as we become more experienced with the exercise prescription, we tend to get a better idea that certain exercises are better geared for lower reps and higher reps. So in my experience, an exercise like a deadlift is much better suited for lower reps, you know, maybe three, five, six, eight reps, not usually anymore. Whereas if you're looking at a single joint exercise for a slow twitch muscle like the rear delt, then I find the higher repetition ranges to be effective. So very rarely are we going to program like a three repetition bicep curl because that just doesn't make any sense. So uh, how do we choose the load is the next question such that we hit the, the number of reps that we want for the training at destination that we want. The most common way of doing this is by calculating the one repetition max and then basing the load off of a percentage of the one rep max. So of course the one rep max is the heaviest weight that a person can lift for one rep. And so the NSCA textbook describes this procedure for calculating the one repetition max where we do a bunch of warm up sets, we rest in between, and then when we select our first testing weight, we test it, see if we can do it. If we did it, we go up, we rest a little more, go up and wait, test it again, and so on. The problem with this procedure is that it takes a really long time. It might make sense for power lifters and some athletes, but for general people, I don't test one rep max that often unless it is a goal of theirs to increase their one rep max. The reason for that being is that for certain people, it's not really safe to test their one rep max. Like I said before, it also takes a big time investment. And then as we're looking at these charts to figure out what load to use as a percentage, the charts aren't really that reliable. So let's say the person's one rep max is 100 pounds and we want them to be able to do six reps. Well, we would take, because the chart says 85%, we would take 85% of 100 pounds and we would give them 85 pounds on the bar and say, okay, do six reps. Uh, or on the other hand, if we had 80 pounds on the bar, we would say, okay, we think that you're going to be able to do eight reps this time. But the problem with this is that the charts are just estimates and they vary from person to person. I find that women are often able to do a greater number of reps at a higher percentage of their one repetition max than men are. 
And even within a person, it can depend just day by day. So the person comes in with less sleep, maybe uh, they haven't eaten well the last few days, they're stressed, they're, these calculations are not going to be as accurate or they're just going to vary. So I find that with a little bit of practice, it's just as good to guess the weight that the person is going to be using. And the way that I would do that would be that I would choose the repetition range that I'm looking for. So maybe it's six to eight reps or eight to 10 reps. And I would choose a light weight to start and I would have the person do a set. And if it's easy, we would go up in weight. If it's good, we would stay the same. If it's too heavy, we would go down. If it was so easy that uh, it felt like warm up, then we would just call it warm up and we wouldn't count it towards our work sets. How we determine whether it was so easy or just right or too hard would be the, rep, uh, the reps in reserve or the rating of perceived exertion that we're looking for. So basically, we would, at the end of the set, ask the person, okay, how hard was that on a scale of 1 to 10? Or how many reps more could you have done? And so we uh, can look at this chart and say, okay, if the, their rating of perceived exertion was around a five or six, they could have done maybe four to six reps more. And so we might call that a warm-up weight. If it was somewhat hard and they could have done about three more reps, then that's an RP of seven and so on until you get to max effort where they couldn't have done any more reps and that's an RP of 10. The mistake that a lot of people make is that they underload. So they are not using enough weight for the number of reps we're doing. Generally speaking, 10 is the default reps that we prescribe people, but we don't just arbitrarily stop at 10 reps. We stop at 10 reps because the load that we're using makes it so that 10 or whatever the number that we're targeting is the ideal reps for the RPE that we're going for. So if you want somebody to have to stop at 10 reps or any number that you choose, you have to make the resistance heavy enough that 10 or 12 is the only, like if we say, okay, we want you to stop at 10, but we want an RPE of eight, then the person shouldn't be able to do more than 12 reps. And so people tend to underload and that's a huge problem because if you are using lighter weights than uh, what you should be, you're not going to get the training stimulus and the adaptations that you want. So generally speaking, especially for beginners, we don't need to train anywhere close to failure. Uh, beginners can stick to like a seven or eight RPE, but for more advanced lifters, uh, in order to maximize hypertrophy and build muscle, uh, we will need to go to failure like an RPE of nine or 10, sometimes at least. Next question is, once we have the number of reps, how do we choose how many sets? Of course, three is the standard, but it doesn't have to be three sets. One or two sets might be good enough, especially for beginners. Basically, we're looking at a law of diminishing returns where people get the most benefit from the first set. And as we tack sets on, there is less and less benefit from there. So for beginners or people who are short on time, you could get away with just doing one relatively high intensity set that will at least help you maintain whatever you have. But of course, two or three or six sets will be even better, but only marginally better as you continue adding sets. So you can see this chart here, uh, strength, power, hypertrophy, muscle endurance, and the associated recommended number of sets by the NSCA, and then the volume where you're multiplying sets by reps. This volume, the idea of volume, is actually the key determinant in hypertrophy. So the more volume the person does, the more likely they are to build muscle, um, provided they are intaking the appropriate number of calories and so on. But the interesting thing here is that the latest research actually shows that you can achieve equal hypertrophy in any repetition range, provided that you're going to failure or close to it. So the reason why 6 to 12 is called the hypertrophy rep range is be just because it's the most convenient. And when I say convenient, it gives you the best bang from your buck from a time standpoint and from a comfort standpoint. So from a time standpoint, you could use heavier weights and do lower reps, but in order to accumulate the same amount of volume, you would have to do more sets and that would just take a really long time. So you could do, let's say you're targeting 36 reps. You could do 36 reps in a strength protocol, 
but that would take way longer than it would do to take to do 36 reps in a hypertrophy protocol just because the rest periods would be longer in a strength protocol. And then also you could use lower weights and do sets of 20 or 30, let's say, but getting to that 20 or 30 maximum uh, repetition maximum is very uncomfortable. So it's much easier to do a 12 rep maximum than it is to do a 30 repetition maximum. And that's why the six to 12 rep range is the generally known as the hypertrophy rep range. Second to last parameter here is tempo. So one commonly prescribed tempo is the 4-0-2-0 tempo, which is that you would lower or your eccentric phase would be four seconds. You, you would pause for zero seconds at the bottom, lift over two seconds, the concentric phase, and then pause for zero seconds at the top. So if you think about this, that would mean that six reps would take, sorry, 10 reps would take six seconds each or 60 seconds total. Most people's sets of 10 don't take a minute. So a more common tempo that people lift at is probably like a 2-0-2-0 or even a 1-0-1-0. But people probably think that they're doing a 4-0-2-0 when they're not. So a nice way to test that out would actually be to Google a 60 beat per minute metronome and actually have that beeping in the background to let them know what the actual tempo that they're doing is. And this can be beneficial if we are actually trying to slow down the eccentric phase or maybe have a certain number of seconds pause at the bottom. Uh, these can be good things to do for beginners as they're learning to groove the movement patterns so that they're not just bouncing in and out of different positions. But it can also be a nice way to increase time under tension as a way to progress people by slowing down the eccentric or giving a pause at the bottom. Note here that the order of the numbers in the sequence here doesn't change independent of the exercise. So it's always eccentric first, even if the exercise was a concentric exercise first, like a deadlift or a step up or a pull up. So it's always eccentric, pause, concentric, pause. Finally, we need to determine what rest periods we will use. And so basically, the heavier the load that we're using, the more that the person will need to rest. And so most people probably sit around longer than they think they do. So it's not a bad idea to time rest periods. If we're doing strength, make sure we're staying in the two to five range, uh, hypertrophy, 30 seconds to two minutes. Um, but with that said, the latest research actually shows that longer rest periods are better for hypertrophy because they enable people to do more reps at a higher load. So timing rest period is good to give a sense, people a sense of how long they're resting, but longer rest may be a little bit better depending on what the person is trying to do. And a lot of people, as they gain more experience, they have a pretty good sense of when they're ready to do their next set again. I will say here that one underappreciated benefit of aerobic fitness is that it can actually help improve recovery in between sets. So even if the person's goal is maximum strength and they say, oh no, I don't need to do any you know, cardio, well, it can actually be beneficial because it can allow them to recover better in between sets and in between workouts. Uh, and so like I said before, uh, when you have uh, shorter rest periods, that's going to take less time and that'll increase the density of the workout, which is the volume divided by the total time. As we are thinking about designing workouts over a period of time, we have to be thinking about progressive overload, which is the idea that we're continually challenging our muscle tissues to continue to make progress and avoid plateaus. There is an ancient myth called the Milo called about Milo of Croton, which is an, a story of a boy who had a baby calf that he carried on his shoulder every day. And over a period of four years, the calf grew into a bull. And by the end of the four years, he was carrying a bull on his shoulder. Uh, but over from a day-to-day -day standpoint, the bull didn't weigh that much more than the day before. And so this is the, an idea of micro-progression where we're just adding a little bit each time. And this also, uh, so if you think about the four years for Milo, his progress looked like the uh, straight line on the left of this little uh, drawing where his progress was linear. We all know that uh, linearity of 
progress doesn't last. So it might last for beginners for six or eight weeks, but over time, progress looks more like that squiggly line. And so uh, the question is, how do we, how, what are some ways that we can progressive overload um, and try to make more progress over time? So the first way would be to increase the number of reps. Um, really, we can look at any of the workout parameters that we've talked about and try to manipulate them here for progressive overload. So increasing reps would be one way, increasing load. Another way that a lot of people don't think about is keeping the load the same, but decreasing the effort for that load. So if you go from an RPE of eight with 100 pounds for six reps to an RPE of six, well, you've actually made progress. Another way of thinking about the RPE would actually be to expose someone to a higher rating of perceived exertion. So maybe for a few weeks, they're just sticking in the sevens. And then the, a few weeks later, you say, okay, you can go towards the nines. That would be another way of just increasing the, stim the intensity of the stimulus. We could also increase sets. Um, so we could go from doing three sets to four sets, which would also increase volume. We could change the tempo. So uh, accentuate the eccentric phase or add a pause at the bottom or top of the rep, uh, or we could also make the concentric phase more explosive. We could decrease the rest periods to increase the density. We could up the frequency. So the person for their first four weeks, they're training two days a week, and then they go up to training three days a week. And we could also increase the complexity of the variation of the exercise that we're choosing. So maybe for four weeks, they're doing goblet squats, and then even with 45 pounds, if they were to go to a barbell squat with 45 pounds, the exercise is a little bit more complex because it requires more balance and proprioception. So that would be a nice way of changing the stimulus without uh, changing it entirely. And I'll give a few more examples of how I do that uh, a little bit later. So I wanna show now a case study of how I would implement all of those um, all the things that I've talked about so far for a 37 year old female desk worker. So this hypothetical person has done cardio kickboxing classes before, but she doesn't have any formal strength training. Her injury history is minimal. She gets low back pain after long periods of standing, pretty typical. She wants to improve her strength and her body composition. She feels like her lower body is a current strength, but her upper body is a little bit weaker. She enjoys body weight exercises and training her abs. She doesn't have any dislikes, which makes it easy on us. Uh, she's available to train two days a week for 45 minutes a session, and she has at her gym dumbbells, kettlebell, or sorry, dumbbells, barbells, uh, cables, and suspension trainer. So here is the two day per week program that I have outlined for this woman. Uh, as you'll see. It's sort of about giving a person a mix of the things that they want with the things that they need. So from this workout, she will definitely get stronger and in combination with a proper diet, she will hopefully improve her body comp. The workout caters to her strengths, which are lower body. So she has a mix of lower body exercises and upper body exercises, which were her weakness. We have a few body weight exercises, which you know, we know that she'll like and several exercises that are targeting her abs. So she'll feel her, definitely feel her ab, abs in the dead bug, in the crawling exercise, in the squat with the pause. Uh, since she's a beginner, for a few of the exercises on the tempo, uh, we've selected a slower eccentric phase, uh, and we've even given her a pause at the bottom of the squat and at the top of the glute bridge, just to really feel those positions. Her RPE is hovering around a seven uh, with one nine thrown in there on the farmer's carry because with the farmer's carry, it's pretty safe to go to failure with that or close to it because you can just drop the dumbbells whenever you're done. Uh, the whole thing should take about, uh, what I'm showing here should take about 30 minutes, which leaves plenty of time for a dynamic warm up, dynamic stretching, and a cool down at the end, maybe some light cardio and static stretching. Uh, I have been thoughtful in terms of introducing the barbell with the angled bar exercises here as a way of foreshadowing future workouts where we will be, impl will be introducing more barbell exercises, hopefully, to uh, provide a higher loading capacity. 
And so that'll come up in the future workouts. So this is just one example. Uh, there are lots of ways we could program for this woman, of course, but this is how I would do it to start her out. Uh, I, also, I should also mention that we've given her a mix of the different movements um, from movement categories, and we're pairing the exercises uh, one, two, so that she goes back and forth between the first two exercises, back and forth between the second two exercises, and so on. Okay, so if all you knew about exercise prescription and program design was the first 51 slides of this presentation, I think you could write really good training programs. But as you become more experienced writing workouts and uh, as the person that you're writing the workouts for becomes more experienced, there are some additional considerations that you would want to make, which I'm going to highlight here. So the first one is the idea that you want to be including both unilateral exercises and bilateral exercises. So unilateral exercises are one leg or one arm exercises and bilateral exercises are two leg or two arm exercises. So in over the course of a training week, you would, or even a given session, if there's time, you would want to have both unilateral and bilateral exercises. So here it's showing a single leg squat with a goblet squat, uh, that, which is bilateral. Uh, you could also do like a, a one arm row and a two arm press. Uh, so just having a combination. You wouldn't necessarily want to go all unilateral in a given workout just because of the added time that it would take to do all that. We also want to be thinking about planes of motion. So the fact that we have rotation as a category unto itself will account for the transverse plane um, and then even into the uh, anti-movement exercises with anti-rotation, that would be anti-transverse plane. But we also need to be thinking about training the frontal plane. So these would be exercises like lateral lunges, crossover step ups, side planks, even jumping jacks um, are all hit hitting the frontal plane. But if you're not specifically thinking about hitting the frontal plane, those exercises tend to get lost in the shuffle of your squats, your bench press, your deadlifts, your pull-ups. Um, so thinking about adding movements in the frontal plane is important. As I mentioned before, the implement that we choose will depend a lot on what the person's current ability is, but some implements are more lateralizations than they are progressions or regressions. So what I mean by a lateralization would be like, the three exercises or the three variations of squats that I'm showing here, um, none of them are any more complex than the other. Uh, so we can use them somewhat interchangeably. And so the idea is that we, every few weeks, we would mix up the implement that the person's using to allow for some minor variation so that the person doesn't plateau, but we're not removing the squat exercise altogether. Um, so just switching it up a little bit can uh, prevent boredom, but without having to remove the squat entirely. So sometimes you hear this concept called variation without change or same but different. Um, and so we can use different implements to accomplish that. But another thing that we need to be aware of is that just because the person has progressed to using a barbell, um, so they're, they're going into these hev more heavily loaded exercises, variations, that doesn't mean that they should never use the other variations anymore. Uh, so just because they can do a barbell squat, that doesn't mean that they're never going to do goblet squats either for warm up or uh, for higher reps later in the workout. Another example of this idea of same but different is varying the position that the person is in for the exercise or the stance. So all of the exercises shown here are rowing variations. But as you can see, there are tons of ways that we can tweak the way that the person is positioning their body um, so that it's still a row, uh, but the demands on balance are, and on their core are a little bit different. So you could go from a side plank to a long seated, to a seated position, to a half kneeling position, or a lunge, and then you can get into your, your standing variations. And so this is another way where we can keep rows in the training program over time and just change it up slightly to prevent boredom and prevent plateaus. A similar example of this would be your grip. So I'm showing pull-ups here. You could use a pronated grip for a pull-up. 
you could use a supinated grip, we would call that a chin-up, or you could use a neutral grip. You could even do a mix of a pronated and supinated grip, and you would call that a mixed grip or an alternated grip. And so you can apply this to uh, pull-ups, you can apply it to rows, um, lots of different exercises. Another thing that we want to consider as we're getting into this more advanced exercise selection is the length tension relationship of two joint muscles. So we have to be thinking about the position of the non-moving joint. So in the case of elbow flexion exercises, so bicep curls, we want to look at what, where the shoulder is relative to the torso. So we could have a position like the person sitting in, on the reclined bench, and so that position would put a stretch on the long head of the bicep that crosses the shoulder as the, uh, as the person's doing the bicep curls. Or we could go towards standing or this um, more prone position on the incline where the person's shoulder is a little bit flexed as they're doing the bicep curl. And this is just going to change how the uh, biceps are contributing to elbow flexion. We could look at the same thing for the triceps and even the calves. Another thing that we want to consider are torque angle curves. So these would uh, also be referred to as resistance profiles or strength curves. And so if you look at the case of a pec fly, a dumbbell pec fly, at the top of the movement, there is very little resistance on the pecs, actually none uh, if you bring the dumbbells together. And then at the bottom, you get this huge moment arm, the horizontal distance between the shoulder joint and the dumbbell. So um, one way to balance out the strength curve would be to use cables instead of dumbbells. So if you use cables, you can look at the direction of the arrow relative to the person's handle, and they're getting much more even uh, torque on the shoulder uh, throughout the range of motion of that exercise. Similarly, if you were to look at a dumb, uh, bench press with a bar, at the top, the moment arm on the pec is much shorter than it is at the bottom, like through the sticking point where the elbows are 90 degrees. So what you can do is you can add a band or chain, and we call this accommodating resistance, to make the exercise harder at the top and even out that strength curve. Finally, in terms of uh, advanced techniques, we have partial ranges of motion. So typically we want to, we prefer full range of motion uh, for the benefits from a hypertrophy standpoint, but, and from strengthening the full range of motion. But we can also, as long as we are including full ranges of motion, we can also include partial ranges of motion. So here I'm showing a, a deadlift from blocks, or you could do this in a squat rack. And so this is uh, this would be called a rack pull or a deadlift from blocks. And it's basically overloading the top range of motion. So because the deadlift is harder usually for most people off the ground, if we start it higher up, the person can use a heavier weight through that, rep that range of motion. Another example of this you could do would be partial squats, which tend to get a bad rep, but if we're using them in addition to full ranges of motion, it's good to overload the top half, especially for athletes, for sprinters. Uh, and you could do the same thing for bench press using a, a shortened range of motion. Um, so now that we have advanced exercise selection techniques, I want to show so, uh, two ways that we can group exercises together in a, a little bit more of an advanced way. So the first one is called a complex. And this would be a series of exercises done in rapid succession, several reps at a time, usually with one implement, usually it's a barbell or maybe it's a kettlebell. And so for example, you might do these uh, five exercises in rapid succession, not putting the barbell down in between each one. Um, and then you would do six reps at a time and then rest at the end before repeating. A similar technique is a chain of exercises or a combination. So in this case, you're doing a series of exercises again in rapid succession, but only one rep at a time. So maybe you would do a one rep of a stiff legged deadlift, a one hand clean, and then one front squat, and you would do that six times uh, through before resting and then repeating all three. So the chain usually refers to three exercises or more together, and the combination would be just two exercises grouped together. Here are a few more ideas from a sets and reps standpoint. You could do reverse sets. So you would do, instead of using, instead of doing three sets of eight, with the same load, you would do eight sets of three. And so actually this technique might even be good for beginners because they would stay really far away from failure and that would help them to dial in their technique. Uh, it, this 
reverse sets are not so great on time just because the person is likely going to rest more in between eight sets than it would between three sets. Here are a few bodybuilding techniques uh, which will extend the set beyond failure. The first is rest pause, uh, which is one set to failure and then a couple more sets of uh, mini sets of a few reps again to failure with just short rest in between each set. The next uh, version of this would be drop sets. So the person would go to failure on, and then they would immediately drop down to a little bit of a lighter weight and do another set uh, and so on. Again, um, you, they could do as many drop sets as they want. There's one version of this called run the rack where you start um, up towards the heavier end of dumbbells and then you just drop down and down and down until you're using five pound dumbbells and people look at you funny because you're struggling with a really lightweight Another way of doing this would be cluster sets. So instead of doing like eight repetitions, you would do four mini sets of two reps with 10 seconds in between. And this would allow you to use a heavier weight um, than you would if you had to do eight reps straight, um, and, but it's only taking 30 seconds longer um, based on having three 10 second rest periods in between the mini sets. Finally, we have cheat reps or forced reps. So there would be one second, one set to failure and then having a partner or using momentum to help push past failure for a few extra reps. Another uh, thing that I wanna uh, show here is how to use time-based workouts. So racing the clock, this, these are techniques that have been popularized by CrossFit, but of course they've been around much longer than CrossFit. The first is AMRAP, so this is as many reps or rounds as possible. So you might set a clock for 10 or 20 minutes and say, okay, I'm gonna do five pull-ups, 10 push-ups, 15 squats um, over 20 minutes, just as many rounds through that as possible. We could also prescribe every minute on the minute. So if you take your reverse sets, you might do your eight sets of three on the minute for eight minutes. So at the top of each minute, you would start your next set. Uh, completion would be, okay, I'm choosing to do 50 reps and I'm going to see how fast I can do those reps um, with a given weight over a period of time. One thing, one more example that I didn't put on here is a uh, protocol called German volume training, which is 10 sets of 10 reps. Uh, so that's really high volume. Uh, it can be good for muscle hypertrophy. It's also very taxing. In closing, I want to... Um, alert people to the idea that everything that I've shown here is from an ideal standpoint. If you had your own gym and uh, all of the things that you, all of the ty uh, types of resistance that you wanted, you could have this ideal exercise prescription. Um, but oftentimes we can't realize the ideal prescription because of factors that are outside of our control like we're working out in a crowded gym and there are people monopolizing the equipment that we want, or even factors that are internal to the person. So these would be things like they didn't get good sleep, they're stressed, they are uh, not adequately hydrated. And so we basically use the exercise prescription and the program that we've written as the basis, but the trick of the trade is adapting on the fly. And so when our workouts are designed based around movement patterns, it becomes really easy to swap exercises in and out based on the fact that uh, the person isn't, uh, their readiness isn't as good to do the exercise that we planned or somebody else is using that equipment. And so we don't have to reinvent the wheel when we have to swap exercises in and out. We can just uh, choose the same movement pattern but choose a different variation or a different implement. And that way we can give the person a pretty similar stimulus um, without having to um, start from scratch. So I present all of the rules over the course of the last hour, um, but in, in actually implementing programs, uh, knowing the rules helps us to choose which of the lesser of the evils are when we have to break those rules. And then the last thing that we have to ask ourselves as we are designing workouts is whether the complexity of the workouts is necessary. So there are lots of fancy things that we can do from an exercise prescription and program design standpoint, but most people are more than happy with just the basics. And so uh, when we're designing workouts, we have to ask ourselves whether the complexity that we're putting in 
is for us because it's more fun as the program designer to make the exercise programs more complex, or if it's because the person actually wants it. And oftentimes, the more complex it is, the less likely they are to adhere. Here's a little bit of a summary slide of everything that I've talked about. So the needs analysis dictates all aspects of the training program. We want to train movements first, and then if there's time, we can think about isolating individual muscles. Pairing exercises and ordering them logically helps to maximize the effectiveness of the program. The sets, reps, and other workout parameters that we choose will dictate the adaptation that we get from the training program. And there are lots and lots of advanced techniques, but sticking to the basics usually yields most of the benefit. Here is the reference that I used for a lot of the tables that were in this presentation. It's the Essentials of Strength and Conditioning textbook from 2016, the fourth edition um, from the NSCA. And uh, you can visit my website for more information on all the topics that I've discussed today, or feel free to email me at travis at fitnesspollinator.com. Thank you so much for watching and I look forward to hearing from you.